thanks everyone for um, coming out on what is a very, very sunny early afternoon in central New Jersey. Um, and thanks to Jess for the introduction, um, uh, to Andy and Tamar for making everything possible as always. Um, Jess's question um, of, you know, which texts um, are you apprehensive to teach? Um, is one of the spurs for this presentation because I find it a bit uh, nerve wracking to teach Hobbes, uh, honestly, even if over the years I've become somewhat more enthusiastic about it than I was. Um, so I'll share my screen now and offer up some general thoughts that have grown out um, of teaching Hobbes as part um, of freedom and citizenship um, uh, over the past uh, several summers. Um, and Above all, I'll be stressing uh, three um, aspects of this teaching um, that I hope we can talk about. Um, first is, you know, how to contextualize Hobbes. Um, uh, I am going to attempt to contextualize Hobbes's place in the Freedom and Citizenship Summer Syllabus, um, and I'll say now and return to um, in a moment the significance um, of his coming first um, after a week that's devoted to Plato, Thucydides, and Aristotle. Um, I found it useful to emphasize to students in the flow um, of our program um, how he connects to and engages with uh, those predecessor readings, um, and also how he opens up um, a space um, for bridging uh, between uh, the texts um, of the ancient Greek Mediterranean and those texts um, of the 1600s and 1700s that will occupy our attention for much of the second week in freedom and citizenship. I also try to convey some of Hobbes's own anxieties about uh, the ancient Greek uh, text that we've all, that we have read uh, by that point um, and the text that uh, we don't read simply because of the economy of uh, the summer uh, syllabus, um, but that are flitting about um, in the background. Um, and here, um, this means drawing attention to Hobbes's fears about the revolutionary potential of reading. Um, I'll quote a passage from uh, Leviathan in a moment um, that's not in the fold of our summer readings, but that um, uh, communicates this uh, point quite clearly. Um, the point um, at the heart um, of this exposition and contextualization um, for me is that Hobbes is in conversation and oftentimes really tense conversation. Uh, with our earlier readings. Um, and it's worthwhile for us to think about um, uh, what the implications of that are. So stepping back from thematic and contextual priorities, um, as a teacher, I'm also um, focusing on the nature of the shift in the student reading experience from week one to week two, as mediated through Hobbes and Locke uh, specifically. Because whereas in week one, uh, the students are reading more or less digestible uh, translations of Plato, Thucydides, and Aristotle. In the case of these 1600s uh, Englishmen, they have the tough nut of some baroquely styled prose to crack, and so really trying to work through some of the opacity of expression uh, in Leviathan uh, is important um, to make to, and conducive to uh, a good seminar experience. So figuring out how to clear the hurdles of, 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 of Hobbes's prose is, is key. After I review that, um, material. I, I'm going to discuss two complementary aspects of uh, the seminar work on Hobbes that get me excited um, uh, each summer. Um, I like playing games. I, I really like playing games with students, um, uh, as, as my FNC colleagues know. Um, and I'm going to talk about one um, that, that I play with them. It, it is very minimalist um, in design and prescription. Um, but the purpose of the game is to try to seed some ideas for how to imagine and play with the state of war um, and how to uh, reason um, about the state of war and the state of nature um, more generally. In the context of that, of that ambition, um, thinking about uh, the state of war and the state of nature, um, I'm also keen to have a conversation with students, um, either before the game or right after it, um, although sometimes it's deferred uh, to the start of the midway um, uh, of the lock session, uh, the, the next day seminar. Um, about how precisely we imagine a state of nature. So what's involved in, 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 in reasoning towards this, this, this abstraction? Uh, when Hobbes or, for that matter, Locke are speculating about a state of nature, are they simply abstracting by reference to some basic assumed as given claims about human beings and their tendencies? How does this compare to something that they've already seen, Aristotle's reasoning um, about 
uh, nature uh, and human beings in nature and what is uh, natural or given uh, within the natural. Um, but more meaningfully for me, um, and as it became clear, especially this past summer, more meaningfully for my students, um, are Hobbes and for that matter Locke identifying communities in the real world of their lifetimes that they see as living in a state of war and their nature? And what does that say about the strengths and limits of their theories and about the state of nature as a colonial and racial concept? Right? So once I get through uh, those points, and I promise I won't be super long, um, I'll, I'll just offer some closing comments on what I've found to be most energizing about teaching Hobbes and what I've learned about Hobbes um, from our students in freedom and citizenship, and then we can have a conversation. So for last summer's work in FNC, um, as part of the nightly written responses that we assign uh, for freedom and citizenship, I made a point of initiating a conversation about the transition from ancient Greece to early modern England through the assignment prompt itself. Um, and so on uh, this slide, you see, first of all, the reading assignment. It's about um, nine pages in the Gaskin OUP edition. And it consists um, of uh, the um, chapters um, in part one of Leviathan, um, where um, Hobbes memorably works up to his exposition um, of, of, of the brutish state of war. But for the response prompt, I asked uh, the students in our seminar to um, think about the approaches uh, that a thinker they had read in the first week, Aristotle, um, and Hobbes respectively pilot um, for thinking about how human societies uh, come into being. I insert parenthetically a little bit of, of beef um, to, to, to get them going. Um, Hobbes did not like Aristotle, um, but he loved Thucydides and they will have read Thucydides. Um, so I asked them in this response prompt, um, which of these approaches, Aristotle's or Hobbes, seems stronger to you um, and why? Um, please cite from Aristotle or Hobbes in support um, of your argument. Um, the results um, of the write-ups, it was a 10 to 4 verdict uh, uh, in favor of Hobbes, um, and I'll say more about the reasoning supplied um, for uh, the, the, the collective verdict um, in a moment. But as a prequel to putting the conversation about Hobbes in their own language, making use of the responses and the language of the responses to ground our collective experience of processing um, Hobbes Leviathan. I do, at the beginning of our seminar, offer some brief biographical contextualization um, of Hobbes, that he's born in 1588 and dies in 1679, that he's our first English language author um, uh, in FNC, um, that He's trained at Oxford, uh, that he develops a very intense dislike um, of Aristotle there, but also a fascination with Thucydides, um, uh, whom he translates um, in 1629. And that he's really connected to, to the monarchy and is a pretty serious royalist. Um, but beyond those bare facts, um, some of which if students are interested in, in my elaborating, I, I can happily elaborate. Um, I draw attention to what I see as one of the most significant continuities um, between the authors in the uh, in FNC for week one and uh, the authors in the early sessions um, of week two, which is that these folks' lives and the texts and political philosophies that emerge from these lives are all intermediated by extremely violent political upheaval. Um, their, their lives that are upended by wars, both foreign and domestic. And so it's not surprising that much of the political philosophy that comes out of these collisions um, is concerned with violence, uh, is concerned um, with how to rein in violence, how to mitigate violence, um, how to devise social structures um, uh, that uh, lower uh, the risks um, of explosive violence. This is violence that for Hobbes um, emerges partly from some of those um, in, innate tendencies um, that he flags in uh, chapter 13 um, of part one of Leviathan, um, tendencies uh, to which we spend a great deal uh, of time uh, devoting careful thought. Um, but it's also derived from reading um, uh, ancient texts. Um, and so in, in Leviathan, Hobbes writes um, that the reading of the books of policy and histories of the ancient Greeks and Romans from which young men 
have undertaken to kill their kings because the Greek and Latin writers in their books and discourses of policy make it lawful and laudable for any man so to do, provided before he do it, he call him a tyrant. From the same books, they that live under a monarch conceive an opinion that the subjects in a popular commonwealth enjoy liberty, but that in a monarchy, they're all slaves. There is much that one can say about this um, in, in another context. Um, and when I teach uh, Leviathan in connection with my citizenship's class at Princeton, there's a great deal of sort of excavation of, of this comment um, and its place in Hobbes's own situating of his project. But for the purposes of the summer seminar, my interest is much narrower. Um, I want them simply to appreciate um, that for Hobbes, some of the texts that we have already encountered in our readings for FNC um, are rich with um, explosive potential. People are taking these texts seriously um, as an invitation to engage in forms of political defiance, disruption, and on multiple occasions, violence. Um, so what does that mean for us? How, how, how do we interact with texts um, that have this this legacy, this this blood soaked legacy, and how do we understand the seriousness with which um, contemporaries of Hobbes and Hobbes himself approached some of the texts from the Greek and Roman Mediterranean that was central to their intellectual formation? Right. So that is an issue that I try uh, to center for them. Um, it's not one that we devote all that much attention to um, uh, in our subsequent discussions of Leviathan, but I do want to set up for them um, a sense of the stakes. Um, th these are life and death texts um, uh, for Hobbes and for others. Um, some of the texts that we will have already read in FNC um, offer a warrant or a sanction um, to participate in activities that can be understood as being deeply corrosive of society. Um, so how do we turn and look at these texts as capable of helping us build up uh, towards a more integrated um, and less fractured society? What is the meaning of this project in our 21st century moment? I have more to say about one of the axes of interpretation that I found most meaningful um, for this line of work in a moment. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll simply tee up um, as uh, a teaser for this, um, Hobbes is thinking um, about indigenous and native communities um, uh, in the Americas um, and the relevance of that thinking to his own construction of political theory, um, which does occupy us later on in the session. So back to what, students wrote up um, and how they tried um, to, to compare um, Aristotle um, uh, and Hobbes. Um, so for one student, uh, Hobbes had a far more concrete argument, I'm um, quoting um, from their write-up, as to how human societies form. Uh, much of history has been a one-upping contest between men. True that, true that. Um, for uh, another student um, who also believed that Hobbes presented a stronger argument, um, he presents all humans as equal um, in the state of nature, regardless of wealth and status, whereas Aristotle pushes for natural slavery, which most people in the present day um, would not agree with. Those who advocated for Aristotle, on the other hand, um, found, had reasons to uh, cite in support um, of their belief um, that uh, Aristotle was much more precise about human societies coming into existence. Um, one of the most important points a student uh, raised uh, in their response uh, is that as different people in the community, they all have different levels of control and power. And crucially for this student, the, the, these, these are different levels of control and power um, that for the student um, seemed uh, to justify Aristotle's claims that already um, uh, even before the constitution um, of, of what we could call civil society. Um, people are just different um, naturally. Another student uh, wrote um, in expressing their agreement with Aristotle's approach um, uh, uh, that on the idea of people living for the sole purpose of achieving fulfillment, happiness, satisfaction, et cetera, this promotes society's goal in serving the people. Whereas Hobbes believes people come together and form a society to get away from the constant fear of death. This picked up a thread of conversation near the end of our first week in freedom and citizenship in 2020 um, that I thought was very revealing. Um, the, there emerged in my class a difference between students who really took a liking uh, to one of the claims in politics one that people come together for the purposes of living but that they remain together uh, in the city state for the purpose of living well um, and those people who thought in my class that the sole reason why folks come together um, is to protect each other from being killed um, and if they believe this they are really all about hops um, this this remained true um, in the remainder of our discussions in week two um, and continuing into week three. Um, 
this was a remarkably efficient way of dividing the class uh, down uh, one axis. One of the benefits to the setup of FNC, um, especially this past summer when we um, did have to go um, uh, uh, virtual, um, is uh, the commitment um, uh, made um, by the program uh, to setting up uh, an annotation interface using Parasol um, that was, I think, quite effective in preparing students um, to engage in the kinds of writing um, uh, that could um, uh, uh, organize concrete reactions to the prompts that we were setting out. Um, but more important to me, um, in addition to uh, than than just the evidence of their annotations, which was important and helpful for me as I planned um, uh, the individual classes, um, was the spirit of their engagement with some of the various games uh, that I set up for them. Now, last summer, gaming of the kinds that I'm fondest of, it was hard to pull off because we were virtual. Um, so as I transition to the second part of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the version of the game, uh, the State of War game uh, that I had tried to develop um, that last uh, saw um, its um, manifestation uh, in 2019. Um, here are the basic uh, rules of this game, um, which I introduce either around the halfway mark of our uh, three-way seminar, um, uh, or if uh, our conversation about Hobbes um, uh, has uh, led us down some productive avenues, I'm happy to defer until uh, the session with Locke, um, which follows the next day. This is a minimally prescriptive game. I try to keep uh, the rules as simple as possible, um, and also not to provide much in the way um, of detail in laying uh, down um, uh, the game's parameters. Um, so I just count off the students, one, two, three, one, two, three, and I ask them to remember their numbers. And then I turn to them and say, well, look, congratulations. Uh, if you're in group one, you have stuff and want more of it. Uh, your options are to take other people's stuff if they are in either of the uh, uh, remaining categories or to team up uh, with other people uh, to take stuff. If you're in group two, you have stuff and you want to protect it. Um, if you are approached by a one, you have to give up your stuff unless you're teamed up with twos or threes who can defend you. Uh, and if you're a three, uh, you have no stuff and you have to rely on the mercy of others. Uh, if you're approached by a one, you must do as they say. Um, if you're approached by a two, uh, you can join them uh, or negotiate to protect them um, in exchange for stuff. Now note that this is not a transparent simulation of the state of war as prescribed by Hobbes. Um, this is actually, um, if we were thinking about the state of war and Hobbes as T naught, this would be like a T1 or T2 scenario in which people have already started accumulating various things in which they're engaged in various forms um, uh, of, of, of rivalry um, and are already possibly in some kind of proto-social state. Um, What's more meaningful for me is to develop a situation in which we can have measured conflictual interactions that approach or approximate a state of war um, and or a state of nature, a distinction that um, uh, gets sometimes confused for them when they're reading uh, Locke and trying to get a grip on uh, how Locke de delineates and defines the state of nature in ways that differ from Hobbes. Um, what I also want to do, though, um, is I don't want to set up a game uh, that um, inadvertently moves in the direction of traumatizing people by teeing up enslavement as an option, for example, or by um, setting up situations in which people uh, in the class um, are um, out and out simulating um, uh, acts of extreme violence. That I don't want to do. Um, I want to keep things playful. It's important uh, that uh, this be um, uh, an interaction that I can sort of physically interact with, um, that I can sort of in, in an embodied way um, um, uh, take pains to ensure um, is, is unfolding um, in the measured uh, ideal that I have in mind for the exercise. Um, but most of all, it's important that I be accessible to them as they work through the possibilities of this game um, and that they be able to come to me and just sort of ask me questions uh, in uh, clarifying what it is that they can do um, with the options that I've provided them. There's a fairly standard progression in the versions of this game that I've played. Um, so 
at first you get people in group one who are fairly hyper aggressive and attempt to commandeer as much in the way of stuff and resources as possible and this goes on for the first 10 minutes um and eventually the tide will begin to turn as negotiations occur um, unfold and different groups um uh, seek uh to arrive at packs for mutual aid or protection against uh, the big bad folks in group one um Eventually, the class will reorganize um, into two groups. Um, so there'll be the, the group one folks um, and uh, their supporters or clients. Um, and then there'll be folks in groups two and three who will have teamed up um, through um, a pact um, of self-preservation. Uh, and in the midst of this, momentum tends to build um, towards cooperation as a way of developing and maintaining uh, a resource equilibrium, uh, to use uh, a slightly fancy term. In the 2018 version of this game, uh, a negotiated settlement that appointed one person to be in charge of everyone's stuff um, uh, was reached, uh, which was great uh, because this confirmed uh, um, uh, our own earlier discussions of um, uh, the Hobbesian uh, design um, uh, of society as laid out um, uh, in Leviathan. Um, but we did have a student who rejected both the premise and the outcome of the war game and removed themselves as a form of nonviolent protest, which I thought was quite cool. Um, so once we're done with the game, I encourage some reflection on the game's dynamics. Um, th there is some meta reflection folded in here um, because I want them also to think about how I've set up the game and whether they would do things differently. And, and invariably, the students do have many suggestions on things that could have been done differently, um, could have been done more in line um, uh, with um, the uh, expectations and assumptions laid down um, in Leviathan, or that could have been done better by reference to uh, their, their own preferences. Um, but I'm also interested as part of this work of meta reflection in the how and why of authority and persuasion. Um, one of the questions I ask them as we reflect on the outcomes of the game uh, is why certain people assumed positions of prominence? Um, how was it that some of the students became authoritative? Who got to be listened to? Um, are there any characteristics um, uh, that can be teased out um, from the tendencies um, manifested in the classroom um, uh, as to who um, uh, received uh, the attention of their peers and who did not? Um, this brings us into a conversation um, uh, about leadership um, and about uh, the the kinds of variables that go into the selection of leaders that more than a few students will um, enter into um, with Aristotle in mind, if not explicitly, uh, then once I, I queue up um, some aspects um, of uh, our week one discussion of Aristotle um, that I had seeded with an eye to our discussion of Hobbes. Um, I find the game hugely rewarding. Um, but there are many varieties of games that can be played um, uh, in order um, to bring out some of the aspects um, of Leviathan um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and Locke's second treatise um, uh, that um, can be sort of most meaningful and relevant um, for a student discussion, um, uh, app apprehension and critique. Um, but I want to turn next um, to a feature of Leviathan um, that I see is, is increasingly central uh, to the work of clarifying for students um, why it is that these um, texts that we're reading in FNC um, have a very contemporary resonance uh, and purchase. So earlier I said that one of the objectives of the game um, was to uh, get them to think about how reasoning to a state of nature um, uh, occurs, um, what kinds of um, baseline assumptions are wired uh, into the thinking uh, that Hobbes and others do um, as part of the project of reconceiving um, uh, and fleshing out um, uh, a, a state of nature. What I also want to do um, is beyond the parameters of the game, get them to drill into moments in Leviathan where Hobbes uh, attempts to show us quite clearly how he is moving towards uh, the work of theory. Um, and so here um, uh, are, um, uh, here's a, a selection um, from part one, um, chapter 13, uh, sections 10 and 11, uh, that um, is most relevant to this purpose and over which I, I try to spend 
uh, as, as much class time um, as, as we have available um, to parse. It may seem strange to some man, uh, Hobbes writes, that has not well weighed these things, that nature should thus dissociate and render men apt to invade and destroy one another. And he may they, therefore, not trusting this inference made from the passions, desire perhaps to have the same confirmed by experience. Let him therefore consider with himself when taking a journey. He arms himself and seeks to go well accompanied. When going to sleep, he locks his doors. When even in his house, he locks his chest. And this, when we know there be laws and public officers armed to revenge all injuries shall be done him. What opinion he has of his fellow subjects when uh, uh, he rides armed, of his fellow citizens when he locks his doors, and of his children and servants when he locks his chest. That he's not there as much accuse mankind by his actions as I do by my words, but neither of us accuse man's nature in it. The desires and other passions of man are in themselves no sin. No more are the actions that proceed from those passions, so they know a law that forbids them which till laws be made, they cannot know, nor can any law be made till they have agreed upon the person that shall make it. So this, this, this paragraph is important um, to excavate um, uh, because one of the um, things that uh, I see as, as, as crucial to the work of reading figures like Hobbes, uh, or for that matter, Locke, um, is uh, testing uh, their own intuitions um, about the kinds of everyday experiences and practices um, uh, that uh, they have and the kinds of precautions um, that they take um, against uh, the uh, intuitions um, uh, that are mooted um, here in Leviathan um, or in other parts of Leviathan. Um, are these precautions that resonate with them? If so, what does that tell them about uh, the assumptions they make about uh, their uh, fellow citizens, uh, their peers? Um, is this a good way of approaching uh, the um, reconstruction um, of uh, the theories that about human nature um, and about human behavior um, that are at the core of Leviathan, uh, namely thinking about um, our own everyday experiences and the kinds um, of precautions uh, that we take. Just generalizing beyond um, the interpretation of this passage, um, is it useful to um, embark on the work um, of theory by paying careful attention to our lived experiences? Um, what are the benefits? What are the rewards? What are the limitations? But it's with the next paragraph um, that I found um, the conversation um, can, depending on the, the, the composition of the classroom, uh, take a very sort of spirited turn um, and, and, and a really rewarding turn, um, especially in light of some of the shortcomings um, of the FNC syllabus in its current iteration um, that I'll say more about um, in a moment. So in section 11, um, Hobbes writes, um, it may peradventure be thought there was never such a time nor condition of war as this. Um, and I believe it was generally so over all the world, but there are many places where they live so now. For the savage people in many places of America, except the governments of small families, the Concord War of dependent on natural lust, have no government at all, and live at this day in that brutish manner, as I said before. Howsoever it may be perceived what manner of life there would be, where there are no common power to fear, by the manner of life which men that have formerly lived under a peaceful government used to degenerate into in a civil war. So for this past summer, um, I was fortunate uh, to have students who were eager to put uh, native and indigenous cultures on the radar of class discussion. Um, one student, our very first day of class, had singled out um, an indigenous woman leader from Ecuador as one of her heroes. Um, and so um, that was already uh, there for um, us uh, to think with. Um, but other students commented extensively on the limitations of their high school US history teaching, um, especially in Zoom chats uh, near the end of week two and continuing um, into week three of FNC, um, especially as this teaching bore on uh, questions uh, of, of non-white experience and specifically native um, uh, and uh, African American experiences um, uh, in the chats. Uh, one student had, had praise for their AP US teacher for teaching them well, um, because the student wrote, um, this teacher, quote, emphasized the voices of indigenous and African people rather than whitewashing um, everything. But the, the general uh, uh, trend of commentary um, was on how 
um, they had found um, uh, their US history teaching uh, to be inadequate to the task of giving voice uh, to Native and Indigenous communities. Since several of our students claimed or made reference to Indigenous heritages in their own families, I'm thinking of two students in my seminar in particular, um, the question of how thinkers like Hobbes and Locke um, uh, reflect on uh, indigenous um, uh, and First Nations peoples um, took on uh, particular salience uh, and poignancy. Um, and here, to um, address myself more explicitly to um, a point I, I mentioned just a moment ago, something that um, we're beginning to reflect on in FNC is, is how to address uh, the, the muting of um, indigenous perspectives and voices. Like, how do you uh, sort of tackle this um, in the kinds of readings um, uh, that we tee up for them, especially um, uh, in weeks two and three. For the purposes of our this class conversation about Hobbes, though, um, the emphasis is less on the properties of our FNC syllabus um, and more about how Hobbes and Locke in their writings um, represent, uh, distort, uh, mischaracterize indigenous and native cultures in the service of ideological commitments and historical processes of settler colonialism that aren't spelled out explicitly in the text themselves, but that need fleshing out if we're to understand what we can and can't do um, with their state of nature theories um, and how we can build better theory. Right? So what are then the sort of takeaways from this kind of exercise um, uh, and from thinking um, uh, with um, Hobbes and the various approaches that um, he develops um, to theorizing uh, the, the state uh, of war slash nature? Well, for one, as I um, referenced early um, on in the presentation um, and as comes out quite clearly um, in uh, uh, this selection um, uh, from part one, uh, chapter 13, um, there are other bases upon which um, Hobbes is constructing his theories that should be of interest to us. Um, uh, howsoever it may be perceived what manner of life there would be where there no common power to fear by the manner of life which men that have formerly lived under a peaceful government used to degenerate into in a civil war. I noted that uh, Hobbes' thinking um, is, is inflected um, by uh, the specter of civil war um, and, and shaped profoundly by it. Um, and this, as I um, had stressed earlier, is one more springboard um, uh, to um, connecting the readings of week one um, which feature multiple references um, to civic disturbances um, erupting into full-scale uh, civil war to the readings at the beginning um, of week two. But for the work of relating Hobbes um, to matters that may be um, uppermost in the minds um, uh, of our students, um, I want them to think both tactically about uh, the design um, of week two um, and more broadly um, about um, the project of reading political theory and using it um, as a way uh, to imagine um, uh, freedom and citizenship. Um, so in the narrowest terms, um, the, the immediate objective um, of our wrap ups um, uh, with Hobbes um, is to bridge uh, to lock. Um, and here is a writing prompt that I um, uh, drafted for this past summer session um, in which I tried uh, to zero in uh, on um, uh, the question of the representation uh, of indigenous and native cultures and get them to think more about um, what this might mean for what they can do with um, and what they might not be able to do with um, Locke and Hobbes. But the bigger stakes, as I see them, are these. Um, I see in Hobbes an opportunity um, for reflecting on political theories, responsibilities to and place within the worlds in which theory emerges. Um, I want them and us as a collective to um, meditate on what it means to theorize a thing like society. Um, how do we identify um, in conversation uh, through play and through analysis, both the rewards and the shortcomings of the theories about freedom, citizenship, the rule of law, uh, et cetera, um, that we're exploring together. And with um, a, an eye on some of the assumptions um, uh, and some of the uh, ingrained tendencies that they will bring into the classroom space, how do we work from uh, the intuitions that we have about our communities, uh, about our relationships to other people, um, about ourselves, 
um, to a, a, a more durable scaffold um, uh, of uh, thinking abstractly um, about our relations to and with other people. So that, that as I see it, is, is the, the reward um, of, 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 of spending time with Hobbes, even if um, uh, at, at every single summer uh, as the Hobbes session approaches, I feel some butterflies uh, in my stomach. Uh, so let's talk about Hobbes. Uh, I, I'm done with my material now. We can just have a conversation about um, what we do with this thinker and other thinkers like him.